everybody needs somebody to measure. Someone to measure. Someone to track. I'm watching your back. Uh, thank you, and uh, Yoshua had asked me if I was nervous about five minutes ago, and I said no, but he didn't tell me that he was going to start off by singing. Um, so now maybe I am, so I'm going to make a little change things up. I thought I'd just do one of the arias from Aida to start out, uh, just to kind of match things. Uh, no, I will not subject anybody to that. I am crazy excited to be here. I have sort of watched from afar Super Week for the last few years. I have heard uh, so many people rave about it and the format is so awesome. I kind of think that the U.S. is getting increasingly uh, lame when it comes to their conferences because Europe seems to be doing things a little differently in a way, in a format that is just amazing. So Yehoshua, thanks for uh, lighting a fire under me and Zoli for uh, having me here. I am super excited to be here. First time to Hungary. Uh, and this is beautiful facility. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to start off this first day with uh, should digital analysts become more data science-y? Looking around the room, you guys are all smart. You probably know that I think the answer to that question is yes. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, so obviously what I'm going to talk about is why I think that is. Uh, before I dive hardcore into that specific topic, I'm going to step back about 24 years to October, 23 years, 1993. And on October 10th, 1993, I was standing on this mountain. And this is uh, Mount Katahdin. It is in the U.S. It is up in Maine. And the reason I was standing on that was because it was the end of a five-month journey that I had taken. And that journey had been on foot. I'd actually been walking for five months. And I had walked on something called the Appalachian Trail, which is a, one of the longest continuous footpaths in the, the United States. Putting it in a little bit of context, this is in the U.S. It basically runs up the entire eastern part of the, of the U.S. At the time I hiked it, it was 2,142.7 miles. You remember down to a decimal point when you're going step by step. I am in Europe. I know about localizing my content. Uh, so that is actually 3,488 kilometers, or pretty darn close to walking from Barcelona to Moscow. So just for a sense of scale. Now, last year, I was on an entirely different journey, but I think that journey from 1993 is actually a good analog to it. The journey I took last year actually started in the fall of 2015, and it started down kind of, in, at the time I was what I would consider kind of a very typical digital analyst from the digital analysts I had worked with, who had worked for me, many that I talked to at conferences. Uh, I'm a consultant, so I actually work heavily with both Adobe Analytics and Google Analytics, but a heavy, heavy user of their web, web environments, uh, the, 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 the various tools that they offer natively, as well as Excel, plugins to Excel, like Super Week, uh, Super, Super Week, <laughs> Super Metrics, uh, the Google Analytics, uh, the Chrome extension. Did a lot, a lot of work and analysis uh, in Excel. And in, and in Chrome, and then use other various you know, social media tools and whatnot. But back in that fall of 2015, I set myself a goal and said by the end of 2016, I wanted to be an intermediate level R user. Um, and actually, I accomplished that goal. The problem is I changed the goal to one that I actually didn't accomplish. So both of these journeys, they actually are similar in a number of ways. For one, they were both super challenging, more challenging than I expected when I started. This is actually a picture of a, of a one-mile section of the Appalachian Trail called Mahusik Notch, where for an entire mile, that's what the trail looks like. It basically just goes through a boulder field. Pretty challenging. Uh, learning R turns out to be pretty challenging. But like a lot of things that are challenging, it actually was very rewarding. Now, just in case you think that's me, it's not. I could never <laughs> shave again in my life. I would never have that much facial hair. That is an adequate representation of how clean I was uh, by the time I finished the trail. So, uh, but it was very rewarding, and, and learning R has been very rewarding, and, and kind of going on that journey. 
The third way they're similar in that in both cases I thought I really knew exactly what the destination was, and in both cases the destination didn't turn out to be exactly what I thought it was when I started. In the case of my journey to R, I got about two or three months into it and I changed my destination and said, you know what, I'm not just about learning this programming language. Actually, it's a little broader than that. I want to become a more data science-y digital analyst. I actually spent about a, a, a hot minute thinking that I wanted to become a data scientist, and then I dug into it more and realized that was overly ambitious, um, and maybe not the right thing to do anyway. So I kind of came up with this data science-y term. And the question is why? Why did I go on that journey in the first place? Why did I change it from just learning R to being more data science-y? May I also ask why does my son insist on cinching his goggles up so tightly that he winds up with rings around his eyes whenever he takes them off? Some questions cannot be answered, uh, but I will answer the R question. So the reason I dove into R and this whole world of data science is because I feel like the analytics, the world of analytics is evolving. And it's a very, very simplistic way to look at it, but it's useful. I think of analytics as falling on a spectrum. And on one end of that spectrum are basic metrics. That is what you get from standard reports in any web analytics tool. How much traffic came to my site? What were my top entry pages? Where did my traffic come from? Uh, we all very quickly move beyond basic metrics, although basic metrics are still very useful. People still want to know how much money did we make on the site overall. We move into the world of segmentation. And that is a very broad and deep category. So we've got new versus returning visitors, certainly. But many forms of multi-channel attribution are really at their core segmentation. How are we bucketing like groups of visitors so that we can compare them and then infer what makes them different? So segmentation is this broad and deep, and I would argue that much of what I, as a digital analyst, was doing was one form and another of, of advanced segmentation. But what I was starting to see and hear and continue to see and hear is there's this other stuff. There are these people out doing this data science thing, and they're using terms that I don't fully understand, and they're doing things that I'm not equipped to do. So as a digital analyst, I felt like I pretty much was living, and many of the digital analysts I, I knew were living on kind of the left two-thirds of that. But what's happened in the last two to five years is that our stakeholders, the marketers, the product managers that we're supporting, they're getting much more self-service on the basic metrics stuff. And I think that's for three reasons. One, they're way more comfortable with the data. When was the last time anybody was actually asked, what's the difference between a hit and a visit, right? That used to be like a once a week question. We had to figure out ways to explain that. So they're becoming more comfortable and more savvy with the data. The tools are getting way better. Look at Data Studio. It's kind of there to enable more self-service or analysis workspace in Adobe. And then finally, as analysts, we've gotten better where we say, we will build you self-service tools. Here's a Chrome worksheet you can log into and you can have some basic manipulation to be self-service. So if that's happening, then what does that mean for our role? If we have to do less of the basic metrics? We certainly can just say, we're gonna do more of this stuff in the middle. And that's fine, there's plenty of analysis work to be done, but I think that's a missed opportunity. I think we should be looking towards data science and saying what aspects of that can we bring into our role to make us more efficient at doing the, the stuff we've always done, but also do things that are new and different and unique that actually add more value in new ways to our organizations. So, I keep saying data science, and I haven't defined data science, and it turns out uh, data science doesn't really have the world's clearest definition. If you ask 10 data scientists to define it, you'll get 10 different definitions. I heard one definition which a data science is an analyst living in Silicon Valley, um, which uh, sounds about right, kind of drives the wage inflation. So as a matter of fact, if you go to Wikipedia and you look at look up data science, that opening paragraph that every Wikipedia entry has says, data science employs techniques and theories drawn from many fields within the broad areas of, and then it lists over 20 different disciplines, and every one of those is a hyperlink to its own Wikipedia entry. So I think that actually kind of confirms that, wow, this is a very broad and deep space, which could be terrifying, or we could say, ah, but that means if we're not trying to actually become data scientists, we can go and cherry pick the pieces of that that we think can be most useful to our roles as digital analysts. So I'm gonna talk about three of them. And I don't know that they're necessarily the, the magic or perfect three, but they're the three that I have kind of focused around for the last year. One is computer programming. That is actually one that I think if anyone is calling themselves a data scientist and they are not using SAS or SPSS or Python or R and really working with the data through a, through a programming environment, 
you probably shouldn't be calling yourself a data scientist. Um, so maybe that one I don't think is as debatable or is uh, optional. Another area is data visualization, which I've been a huge fan of data visualization for years, but it's as I've gotten into this more data science-y world that I realize there's kind of a broader use of data visualization that, uh, that comes into play. And then the final area is statistics. And regularly, I will talk to a, you know, meet somebody or talk to a friend or a family member who says, oh, you're, a, you're an analytics, so you like, you're like, you do a bunch of statistics? And I'm like, well, I probably do more statistics than you do, but no, like this, it's not a topic that I'm very deep on. Because it turns out that yes, I know what a regression is, but then when I try to go to the world of categorical variables like dimensions, how do you do a regression with device category? I don't know. Well, you can. There are ways to do statistics with web analytics data. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity there. So I'm going to talk about computer programming. I'm going to talk about all three of these. Just to be clear, when I say computer programming, I'm talking about a text-based scripted language. Uh, if you look, look, blur your eyes, you can imagine that this is Excel VBA. You can imagine this is JavaScript. This happens to be R and R Studio. I will say this is not JavaScript. JavaScript is computer programming in the service of the collection and capture of data. And when we're talking about the world of data science, we're talking about computer programming in the service of working with the data. So in a lot of ways, computer programming with data is a lot like boiling water. What's well, a lot like boiling water if you're thinking in terms of the Appalachian Trail? And I can, I'm not going to let that analogy go. That was such a great setup. So we're going to come back to the Appalachian Trail a few times. Anybody who has done any backpacking, overnight backpacking, knows that typically you need to boil water. And you need to do it quickly and effectively and efficiently. Back when I was hiking in 1993, almost everyone who was doing uh, long distance hiking was carrying one of two stoves. Either one was called a Peak One, one was called a Whisper Light. And it was probably roughly 50-50 split. So you'd roll into somewhere to camp, there'd be somebody else who was camping there, you'd pull out, you'd start cooking, I'd have my Whisper Light, they'd have their Peak One, and it was an easy way to have a common you know, conversation was we could debate which was the better stove. And as you might expect, if you've got roughly equal adoption of two things, there's not one that is just unarguably better. They both have their pros and cons. And what I learned very quickly in my journey last year was that that same thing happens when it comes to Python and R. They have a lot of similarities. They're both programming languages. Python is technically a general purpose programming language. R is a programming language of, for, and by the analyst. They both are open source, which means they are free licensing. They both are supported by enormous communities. We think the Google Analytics community is large. Hop onto Stack Exchange with a Python question or an R question, and it makes the Google Analytics community look actually quite small. Most importantly, they're both readily connectable to digital analytics and other data sources. So I am going to talk about R a lot today. It wasn't in the title of the session, but that is the journey I've been on. That's the one that I am learning. So that is not because I think R is, in absolute terms, superior to Python. I'm not really equipped to talk to that. I can talk about what I've heard. There are plenty of people who use both R and Python. But every time I say R, it's going to be on you to insert, he really means R or Python. Uh, because I think they're, they have trade-offs, but they're both, in many ways, I think they're more similar than different. So when we're talking about programming with data, on the Appalachian Trail, this is a picture of what's called Klingman's Dome. It's pretty early in the trail, hiking from south to north. It's in the Great Smoky Mountains on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. It's the highest point on the Appalachian Trail. And I didn't really plan it that way, but I realized that I was standing at the highest point on the Appalachian Trail during the commencement ceremony for my college. So I made this hike when I was graduating from college. It was a good time to do it. I still graduated, I just didn't go through the pomp and circumstance of walking across the stage. I was more interested in taking a walk in the woods. So education, be it through university, be it through attending a conference, be it through reading blogs online, uh, is a form of power, right? It, knowledge is power. And programming with data gives us a new kind of power beyond the world of just working with other, other interfaces. And it gives us power in a couple of different ways. One, kind of the most basic for me, is data extraction. And I know plenty of analysts, I've met analysts, who are programming with data, and this is really all they're doing. And they are better analysts for it than, than not doing it. So if you think about it, when you're using the Google Analytics web interface, they're basically using their own API behind the scenes. But that means they have to make a bunch of decisions about how they're allowing you to look at the data. 
when you use a plugin, if you're using Supermetrics or you're using the Google Sheets plugin, that's still an interface to the API that has some inherent decisions put in it. When you start programming with data, you're getting much, much closer to the API, which opens up opportunities to do a lot of things more efficiently uh, and with more flexibility. One example, um, I've had in the last, uh, I've got a, like two clients that are both 360, GA 360 clients, which really isn't material to this, but they both are cases where there's one company that has a bunch of different websites. And the way they're set up is each website has its own web property, uh, not that uncommon. And also not that uncommon, somebody says, what was this metric for this one site? Okay, that's a basic metric, I can go in and get it. And then they say, huh, I want some context. How does that compare to all of our other sites? Still not that hard to get, right? I go to this, that standard report, I get the number, and then I just sit there and flip through the views and pull the same number for the same date range from the other sites. Tedious as hell, not particularly interesting. Uh, maybe still only take me, though, 10 or 15 minutes. Well, when I'm programming with data, I can, I can make that a much more efficient and reusable uh, mechanism. If you're wondering, that's the Eiffel Tower with my daughter. She was actually having a great time, but she, she saw the camera come out and thought she would scowl, I guess. Um, so this, we're gonna walk through in detail, line by line. No, we won't. I actually did write this script uh, in about 15 minutes, uh, and this was uh, late last year. It's 22 lines of code, so I'm not counting comments and spaces and line breaks where it was just making the code more readable. There are essentially 22 lines of code. I'm not a great programmer. I recognize it's probably 22 lines of terribly written code. I knew I was coming here, so I said I probably ought to make a little bit of an effort to make it a little bit more efficient. So I managed to spend like another 45 minutes, longer than it took me initially, and I managed to cut it down to 17 lines of maybe okay written code. But what that does, that code does, is it actually goes and pulls from 38 different Google Analytics views, and you're like, wow, 38 different API calls. I clocked it, 19 seconds. Um, and it pulls back, and then it just pushes it out to a common delimited file, and what this is is each row is a different view, and then it's got sessions, page views, and total events, and it looks a lot like an export from Google Analytics until you stop and say, oh wait, every row in that is actually a different view. So that seemed kind of cool. Kind of quickly walking through what it's doing, a guy named Tom Miller, who's now at the, the Hartford Insurance Company in the States, told me early on in my journey, he said, one thing you'll learn about R is that R is kind of written of, for, and by the analyst, so you will find that it very naturally matches your own thought process. So when I walk through, how would I want to pull all that data? Well, the code, one little line of code actually pulls all the views that I have access to with my Google credentials. I then filter it down to just the one Google account that I care about, the one client in this case, and then I actually only want the production views, and we've got decent naming conventions, so I can just pull only the list of views that start with PROD from that. That's where I got 38 views. There's a little bit more code. It's not that complicated once you've gotten familiar with the syntax that pulls data for each of those views. I tack it on into one master list, and then I pretty up the column names because you are, when you're working with an API, you, know, you don't get spaces and capitalization like you want. So that's a big chunk of the code, and it's really just making the output a little cleaner, and then I push it out to a, to a tab-delimited file. So that's all that's going on. Are there any Adobe users in here? Or would they admit it? Okay, let's skip that. Uh, didn't know. So that's kind of just one simple little example. Now that example, it turned out I was hanging out with Where'd she go? Oh, there she is. Astrid, last night, and she was like, hey, I want to do this thing where I crawl through a bunch of different views that we have and pull some stuff from it. I'm like, oh, wait till tomorrow. Uh, I've got that code. Sent it to her last night. So that actually leads to how, when you're programming with, code, with uh, data, it, it tends to be more reusable and extensible. I have built the monster spreadsheets before that are great and they're efficient, and then I say I want to reuse half of that for something else. And then I have to make the decision. Is it going to be harder for me to rip out the stuff that I don't want to use and riskier because I don't quite trust Microsoft to not start introducing little corruptions and leave little artifacts behind? Or is it smarter for me to just start from scratch and follow the same model? I find myself starting from scratch more often. But when you're working with text-based code, you can just copy and paste chunks and, and, and kind of work with exactly what you want to edit. So this was the example we looked at, and that gave us um, for one thing, it's reusable. The only thing I had to blur out 
I mean, on the projector, it's effectively all blurred out. But trust me, the only thing that's blurred out to make this not giving away any client information whatsoever is just one little bit of text, which makes me realize I can easily post that or send that, send that to Astrid and say, yeah, I'll just change that to you know, a placeholder and she's good to go, and I haven't revealed anything. That is a lot easier than saying, oh, I'll dummy up, I'll try to clean up my Excel file and send you that uh, to use. That's painful. That gave us a CSV output. What if instead, actually, I, what I wanted to do and did do was that other client I have that has a bunch of web properties, and there was a question around what is the distribution of visits from paid sources versus non-paid sources? And same idea, we wanted to crawl through all of their production views. So I reused the code, I changed the logic so I was looking at different views. Then I changed the data I was pulling because I wasn't just pulling sessions, page views, and total events. I was actually pulling with a segment of non-paid traffic and a segment of paid traffic. And then I wasn't pushing it to a common delimited file, I was actually generating a visualization. So ultimately I probably changed 50% of the stuff, but that first 50% I was immediately able to, to reuse. Super, super powerful. Uh, another example, a little bit more involved. This happens to be Adobe, but that's kind of immaterial. I've got a client, and, and you will learn in the next 30 minutes. Uh, I love often looking at two dimensions. Kind of when, when a user will say, can we see what our traffic or orders or conversion rate is by device category? And, and I'd also like to see it by channel. I'm like, well, don't you really want to see it by both of them? Because there may be a heavy, heavy overlap and it can often be really useful to look at it across two dimensions. In this case, the client, they have their, their channel, and then they actually, most of their visitors wind up authenticating, and they, they have them in a customer segment, which they capture in an EVAR or a custom dimension. So, great, I wrote a script that said, for your KPIs plus a handful of other metrics, I'm gonna go and make a heat map that shows how that breaks down. And now I can quickly get a sense of where the volume is, or where uh, things, where the, the highest conversion rate is. Okay, so I've got a visualization built, I've got the logic to pull that. I can easily swap that out to say use two other dimensions, and we'll look at an example of that in a bit. But in this case, I had this other thing I did, which is on a weekly basis go and look for anomalies in the data around those same, um, these, those same two dimensions. So I'm still using the same logic as to how I'm identifying where I want to get the data, but I'm pulling entirely different data, doing entirely different processing on it, and then doing a related but slightly different visualization, because you'll see this doesn't have big numbers, it's got this plus zero, minus zero, plus three, minus one. We'll come back to that example later, but that's another example of where I was able to kind of build up and extend what I'm doing. And I can post all this. Um, I can put it on GitHub, because not only is R and Python are both open source, but the code that you develop, you have the option to also share that out with the community for reuse. It's something I'm hoping happens uh, there is not a great single library of, of reusable R scripts for digital analysts. We're kind of working on something. Uh, a guy named Randy Zwitch and Jason Thompson in the US stood up analyticsplaybook.org and it didn't really take off. Uh, Mark Edmondson, who will be here later, uh, and I have set up uh, something else that's sort of trying. We haven't really got it figured out, but you can post your code out there. It's there. Once it's out there, we will solve the problem of how do we get this some sort of consolidated searchable view. But I think that's really uh, exciting. The analytics community has always been a community that shares, shares ideas, shares the things they're doing. When you're using, uh, when you're programming with data and you write your code sort of cleanly so you can easily not give away any proprietary information, we can actually share that in the community and, and you know, reuse things across industries, which is really cool. So that's the programming piece. Shifting from text-based programming stuff over to data visualization. We'll hop back onto the Appalachian Trail briefly. This is Franconia Notch. Uh, it's, the, it's up in New Hampshire. The trail runs right along this ridge um, in, a, in a horrible, crappy conference setting where you're in a basement in a conference room somewhere. You say, unlike this place we're at, but here you can just kind of momentarily look out the window and get the same basic view. But we're talking about data and how we're actually making the data come to life in a way that has an impact. And this was a very key sort of evolution for me over the course of last year, um, is how's data visualization different when you're using R or data science concepts. So one question is where does R really stand out? And if we say just mechanically, how does it stand out? How is it different from Excel? Well, it's different from a sheer variety perspective. 
there's a whole website devoted to just kind of like little R visualizations. And a lot of these visualizations, you'd look at it and say, oh yeah, I can do that in Excel. But then you see things like a word cloud. Like, oh, you can't really do a word cloud in Excel. You see, well, whatever this is, I'm not really sure what you'd do with that. Um, you have things like Venn diagrams. And I, I actually sometimes like to use Venn diagrams to say, it's an apparel retailer. They have menswear and they have womenswear. And I want to see the scale of traffic between menswear versus womenswear, but I also want to get a sense of how many visits are overlapping or visiting both. It's a segmentation question. Segment for visited menswear, segment for visited womenswear, combine the segments, that's my overlap. With R, I can very quickly visualize that and get a, a view of that uh, relative scale, including the overlap and then quickly manipulate on further slices of the data. I can do what's called a core gram. We're going to look at a variation of this uh, later as well. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, so please don't do pie charts, no matter what tool you're using, or donut charts, for the love of God. Um, you can, if you're a big Star, uh, Star Wars fan, you can actually you know, draw BB-8 with R. That's clearly gratuitous, but hey, it's doable. Uh, that, would, I don't, that would be really tough to do in Excel. So that's one way it stands out. The other way it stands out um, is a little tougher to sort of articulate. And that is, when I started, I, when I, back in that, that, when I started my journey back in the fall of 2015, I would have, I viewed analysis kind of as, as two parts. One, I've got to identify the hypothesis, gather my requirements, and start digging into the data. Like doing the analysis, rolling up my sleeves, getting into the messy data, maybe doing some quick charts here and there. And then, the really, uh, then I had to take that and communicate it out to the business stakeholder. And that's where the world of storytelling and truly, you know, really putting care into the data visualization came into play. So I saw data visualization as being primarily important when it came to communicating results to the business in a way that they could, at a glance, understand what the results were saying. But where I've evolved is to start thinking that, no, data visualization really can span both parts of that, uh, both parts of this process. And I'll admit that people had told me that before, and I had kind of said they didn't understand and they were not right. Um, and that was, I was not right. So to be clear, there are, ours does not corner the market on using visualization to um, explore the data. Tableau has built their, uh, their whole business on saying, you can interact with the data much more richly than you can in Excel. But when data scientists are thinking about visualization, they do have an ability to do something that is somewhat unique and very, very useful. And that is making visualizations that are interactive and reactive. Now, everybody just gave me their confused puppy dog impersonation. What? Interactive and reactive? What are you talking about? So you guys, don't do it now, because I'm not sure how the Wi-Fi. I'm going to show a version. Uh, we'll have this URL later. I'm going I'm to attempt the live demo. Um, the version of that bit.ly you can do with your own uh, Google Analytics data. This is one that's already just kind of locked into a specific uh, view. I mean, you can go to this one too. It's just not as interesting. So, so right now it's got country and device category. So we looked at kind of a heat map like that earlier. Pretty quickly realized that sometimes something would show as being dominant, and it was just because there was some big spike. So the, the exact same grid is repeated uh, below, so I can quickly look and see, is that a pattern that's been holding? So I could do this in Excel. I could do this, I could automate this in Excel. You know, pick your plugin to pull in data from Google or Adobe or, wh or whatever you want. Use conditional formatting, I'm all set. This is clearly a heavy US-based site, so it's not that interesting. But if I wanted to change it and say, well, wait, I actually do care about looking at my channel versus the, um, versus device category. And in this, the case of this client, they are notorious for their media agency just spending money on mobile, uh, even though they shouldn't be. Um, so this starts to look a little more interesting and useful. I've got my, my channels and my device category. And as I started to show, this isn't requerying the data. I'm actually saying, oh, I want to see you know, more, uh, more values. So the final thing I want to talk about is statistics. And I think there's no better way to talk about statistics than answer the question, what is a p-value? Now, I am sure there are people in here who intuitively internalize what a p-value is and what it represents. 
I am that person for very small windows of time, and then I go and have a meal, and I lose it again. Um, so the, the website 538.com has, has had all sorts of fun kind of with, with p-value. In the States, the American Statistical Association actually said this is enough of a problem uh, that when we're trying to communicate to various people what a p-value is, and we start getting into statistics speak, they t took 26 statisticians and said, you guys get together and write a simple and clear and concise definition of a p-value. And they went in, they, they worked on it, and this is what they came up with. Now, if you're trying to write something that is simple and clear and concise, and you feel the need to start your definition with the word informally, <laughs> I think you're kind of admitting that you failed. Because it turns out p-value is totally intuitive to somebody who actually has a thorough and deep understanding of statistics. A lot of us go around and say, well, I just need a number less than points, a p-value less than 0 0.05, and then we're like, well, what does that really mean? And I'm like, uh, let me go to the Google and explain it. Now, it turns out there is a very simple, clear, and concise definition of p-value. Uh, I believe he's a past speaker at Super Week, uh, Mr. Jim Stern. And uh, from the Devil's Data Dictionary, it is a statistically significant pregnancy test. So, a p-value, everyone? Everybody got it? Okay. So, simple, clear, concise, just not actually that useful. To me, that's just a way to say that, that I think this is, a, this is kind of a scary topic. It's a scary topic for me. It's a scary and or ignored topic by many, many analysts. When was the last time that you actually did a correlation with your web analytics data, the simplest of, simplest of statistical things? Um, what about a least squared regression? We sort of know what that is, but then we turn and look at our data and say, wait, how would I use that? I suspect I should be using it, but how? How do I use that with categorical data? Confidence levels, confidence intervals, sure. Optimizely, uh, you know, tells us what the confidence interval is. Uh, Adobe Target gives us the confidence level. Do we really understand what that means, or we just kind of take what the tool tells us and assume that we're okay? What about outliers, right? An outlier can totally blow our data, our analysis if we don't know, have a methodical way to identify outliers and then determine is this an outlier that I should dig into and try to figure out why it's there? Or is it an outlier that purely is just noise that I should remove before really conducting the rest of my analysis? What about type one versus type two errors? In what situations is a false positive result a higher risk than a false negative? And what can we do to actually kind of skew the what we're doing in the, in the appropriate direction to minimize risk? Uh, are we doing something that's Bayesian versus frequentist? This is uh, my Matt Gershoff bullet. He has uh, spent the last three years trying to explain to me the distinction, and he ends everyone saying it doesn't really matter, but then he proceeds to use Bayesian versus frequentist, and I think it matters. This is another, this is, Bayesian versus frequentist is not a right or wrong, that I understand. It is just kind of how are you approaching, fundamentally approaching the data? And I don't run into many digital analysts who are thinking about any of this on a regular basis. And that's partly because it's hard. Because I changed my destination, not just to be learning R, um, I actually, the statistics stuff is where I am still working really hard. Um, and I'm getting there, I'm slowly chipping away. One example, I did this last spring and I got pretty excited, this is a core gram. This is also an example of a visualization I would never show to a business user. But this is 360 days of daily data, broken down by uh, channel, and correlated. Every combination of two channels is correlated with each other. So if you go across a row and a column, what you're getting is the scatter plot of those two channels. And then on the diagonal, you're actually getting the R value, which has nothing to do with the R programming language. Uh, and this is one line of code. From taking maybe a dozen lines of code to pull the data, I can now quickly say, are there any correlations in this data? In this case, didn't turn out to be that useful. Display and video have the highest correlation. Hmm, they're managed by the same agency who turns on the spin for display and video at the same time and turns it back off so they're more correlated. But I still get pretty excited about the possibility this is not something I could quickly do in Excel and quickly iterate on, quickly apply a segment to and then look at it again. So that's one example. Now one that I totally use and I'm almost more excited, it, it has little to do with the actual programming and all about to do with the, the, the way that I'm looking at the data. For at least 15 years, this question has bothered me. When I am doing a daily or weekly or monthly report, here's your KPI. Here's how it changed relative to a target, the last time period, same time last year. Here's a trend line. 
And the human instinct is to look at that KPI in that report and say, ah, oh, the metric went up or down. Why? Why, analysts, tell me why it went down? And there's a problem with asking that question. No metric ever stays perfectly flat. And we're just kind of chasing things that may or may not need to be chased. So the first question that I always want to answer is, did it move enough for me to give a shit? And how do we figure that out? I've done various things that were bad, probably just trying to communicate that over in the past. It's only been in the last couple of months that I've realized, hey, this world of, of statistics, I can actually do some stuff where I can have a very efficient and meaningful way of answering that question. Did it go down enough for me to need to look into it? And you do that with forecasting. Like forecasting, well, this is how I always thought about forecasting. Never crossed my mind that I'd want to be looking at forecasting. Forecasting is about the future, right? Well, not in this case, it turns out. There's some pretty cool stuff you can do with forecasting. Walking through it really quickly is we start by pretending that today is not actually today. Today is some point in the past. And if today is some point in the past, then there's some data that we don't have. So we just kind of remove it. From that, we develop a forecast. And I'm not going to run 30 minutes long by explaining the Holt Winter's forecasting process, but there's some really cool stuff about taking time series data or non-stationary data and breaking it down into, oh, my data moves like this every week. Let me pull out that as one part of the, my historical data. Let me put kind of a moving average on it to see how it's trending. And now let me take what's left, and that shows me how noisy the data is. With that, I can actually you do a much, much better job of building a forecast, and so I do that. But I still know that a forecast is never going to be perfect. So as part of developing that, I'm also going to put a prediction interval around it. And that's based on how noisy the historical data is. So a prediction interval is like a confidence interval. So I put those bands around it and say, you know what, assuming everything stays relatively stable, 95% of the time in the future, the actual result is going to be within that prediction interval. Now I come back to the actual today and put my data back on. So two days ago, yeah, the, the value went down, but it was still within that prediction interval. It's, there's a good chance that is just the noisiness of the data. But then today, or maybe that should be yesterday, um, it actually dropped outside that prediction interval. Maybe I should go look at that a little bit uh, deeper. It is, it's embarrassing how excited I was over the holidays when, when all this sort of came together. This is, if you ever have read about Adobe, uh, Adobe Analytics anomaly detection, that, this is the process they are using. Um, and you can, you can build this yourself with any set of time series data. Matter of fact, I've got a weekly report I do for a client, and that's exactly what I do. It's a little hard to see, but that last week has those bands on it. But mainly what I want to look at is for each metric, for the weekdays, how many anomalies were, how many anomalies did I have that were positive above the prediction interval? How many were negative? And most of the time, 95% of the time, it should be zero and zero. The chart becomes, starts to become gratuitous. That's just showing what's really happening. So if I say, really, I just care about the how many good, how many bad anomalies, guess what? Remember this chart from earlier? That's what this is showing. Because I understand now what this is, is, is doing, I am now looking for anomalies in 49 different cells breaking down my traffic. And I'm doing that for eight different metrics. And it's automated. So I can quickly glance at it and say, did something go awry in the past? Does that seem kind of cool? If I put, yeah. Stefan's still, a, still awake, so uh, <laughs> that's good. I got 12 hours of sleep last night, so if I can't keep him awake, nobody can. Or, no wait, that's not right, whatever. So that's, uh, so that's, that's one use, looking at the past to the present and saying, did something change when I didn't expect anything to change? But I can take that exact same idea and actually say, when I made a change, what kind of an impact did I have? And this is like mention number two or three of Mark Edmondson. Uh, he built that exact thing. It's a Google Analytics user. You can go to his uh, uh, GA effect. Uh, page, you can authenticate with your, uh, your account, and this is doing, in this case you're saying, we launched a campaign on this date, or we redesigned a page on this date, and you tell it that's the date. Then the system goes and builds the data leading, uses the data leading up to that point to develop a forecast with a prediction interval around it, and says, if you didn't change anything, this is what we would expect to have happen. 
And then you plot your actuals on top of it. And now when you say, when somebody says, do a pre-post analysis, you've got much more confidence in saying, this is how much that metric went really out of where we would not have expected it to occur 95% of the time. And then he actually kind of builds it up. So you can start to really answer the, what was the impact of that change when I'm having to do a pre-post instead of a, an A-B test. So, everybody excited about R and statistics? You guys ready? So for the handful of you who might say, yeah, this is pretty cool, I wanna dive into that. I've got three recommended resources. One is the Measure Slack team. Quick show of hands of how many people are in the Measure Slack team now. Pretty good, the rest of you guys, you have a homework assignment. Whether you wanna do the R and statistics stuff at all or not, go to that URL, sign up. It's like, a, um, it, it's like an organized and consolidated, I think there are like 2,000, 2000 people, Michael? You have any idea? About 2,000 people in it. They're all digital analysts. It's more organized. But there's an R and statistics channel, which is very active, very helpful people uh, who are digital analysts who are doing this sort of work. And you can ask them questions and watch what they're doing. Super cool. Uh, another is this website, dartistics.com. I have to take the blame for the name, because um, I am not a marketer. That is short for Digital Analytics R and Statistics. The entire website was built with R. And it is there for a lot of the challenges I had as I was learning R was because a lot of the examples weren't really geared towards digital analytics. I was using data sets that I couldn't mentally translate to the web data that I was used to working with. Um, and Mark Edmondson gets the credit for probably two thirds of the content and the knowledge of how to actually build a website using R, which turns out to not be that difficult and is just one other cool thing that I won't talk about. And then finally, uh, Mark and I are actually doing a three day class uh, in Columbus in June, and we've actually gone out and gotten a professor of statistics to where we are, we are working with him to come up with digital analytics scenarios and using that as the mechanism to teach about chi-square, Holt winners, factor analysis, regression. Um, so kind of obligated to plug that. So that brings us to basically the end of this session. There were a handful of links. I'll get these communicated out some way that we, we covered. I've got to want to close with one final uh, thought. So I said that uh, one of the similarities between these two different journeys was that when I started both of them out, I had a different destination in mind from what my actual destination became. In the case of R, or in case of, uh, I thought I was gonna look, just learn R and I broadened it out. In the case back in 1993, uh, I thought I was going to figure out what I wanted to do with my career because I had just gotten a degree in architecture, which I was spectacularly ill-suited for. So I said, I'm gonna spend five months walking in the woods, I will figure out what my career should be. It took me another eight years to find analytics, so I did not achieve that destination. However, what I didn't think about, because I wasn't aware of it, was that I was a, a male, 21, 22 year old with raging hormones, apart from his girlfriend for the better part of five months. So, whether it was a fully rational decision or not, I decided that I could not live without her. So she came out to hike the last mountain and pick me up. I proposed, we've been married for 23 years, it's worked out okay. So in both cases, I gave myself a challenge, I picked a destination that, that had made a lot of sense, I had a timeline for it, and I headed out on the journey. In both cases, the journey changed a bit. Uh, the actual destination, in both cases, has worked out phenomenally well. Because I'm getting to speak so early in this conference, that's kind of my challenge to you guys over the course of the next few days, whether it's from a session or a conversation you have on the side, I hope you all, as you're traveling back home, try to think of a challenge that you want to throw out for yourself that you think will help you grow professionally. Knowing that you may not actually hit that destination, but in my experience, those sorts of journeys, you always wind up being glad that you made them. With that, thank you very much. I need you.